Good morning. Good morning. So sorry, I'm running a few minutes late. One of the um, USB ports on my laptop decided to break overnight somehow. I swear the thing's just been sitting here, but I come in this morning and it's dangling. And trust me, you do not want to hear this lecture through my laptop's default microphone. So we should be good to go now. We will continue talking about limits and, uh, and eventually we'll talk a little bit about um, horizontal asymptotes and the connection with limits. It's actually, I expect that's going to be something that is um, relatively easy for you guys because even though nobody told you the notation that you used to discuss horizontal asymptotes, both in precalc and in Mac 1105, if you're following the textbooks from those classes, is the same notation really as limits, just without the word LIM. So let's see, is this gonna work? No. Maybe it had something to do with that. Maybe that's why it's broken. This should be table broken. No. All right, so the USB port that broke was the port that I normally plug the dot cam into. So I switched some things around. It doesn't seem to like it. So I'm going to restart this software. Cross our fingers. Yeah, OK. That's fine. Um, see if it works. While we're doing this, I guess, while I'm farting around with the tech, um, were there any questions from the homework that you guys wanted to look at, especially badly? Yes, can we look at number 13, please? Sure. 21. 13 and 21. Any others? 16. 13, 16, and 21. Okay. Okay, is this going to work now? Please work. Okay. It's not seeing it. I guess it's possible. I do have the board behind me, and we could use the board for today's lecture. It's just it's not as easy for you guys to see as it is with the dot cam. So I'll try this QCAM thing one more time before I give up. What is this? Installing device driver. Oh, I see. So for some reason, when I plug this in here, it doesn't want to work as readily as, as it did in the other one. Well, maybe I can talk a little bit and show you on the board a little bit while this thing claims to install drivers. And we'll see how it goes. 13, 16, and 21 were requested, right? Yes, sir. OK, so 13, I can walk you through on the board really quick. The only real difference between uh, this and some of the ones that we've done in the past is the notation. I asked to open that. Um, so let me let me pull up the board behind me. Can you guys see the board okay? I'll take a look at the picture you have. Mr. P. Yeah. How do I make it so that you um blow up? On the at least my latest, I, so I'm not really sure. Like, <laughs> actually, now that I think about it, that was a really bad way to put the question. <laughs> so, you are the only one I'm looking so that the board behind you is bigger. I think you 
go to speaker view. Um, so in your in your view options in the um, yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you. That should do it. All right. So while this thing is claiming to install drivers, it's still trying to do that. Oh, it looks like yeah. Okay, it is. Um, I'll go ahead and do these on the board. I don't know how the lighting is. But let me know if you can or cannot see this. So I wanted to calculate the limit as h goes to zero of six plus h to the negative one. Minus six to the negative one all over h, right? Can you read that okay? So visible. Yes. So the trick here is just going to be grappling with the notation a little bit. Six plus h to the negative one and six to the negative one are the reciprocals of six plus h and six. So this is the limit as h goes to zero of one over six plus h minus one over six all over h. So that's the thing that we need to need to sort out. And just like the other kind of similar problems, the trick is going to be doing some bit of algebra that will allow me to cancel the factor of h downstairs. I don't definitely don't have a factor of h upstairs right now that I can pull out. So it's going to require like having a common denominator and putting things together, but we can get there. So if I want to clean up the numerator, um, I need to combine those two fractions. That's, that means I'm going to have to have a common denominator. And between 1 over 6 plus h and 1 over 6, the only reasonable denominator is 6 times 6 plus h. So I treat this as the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over 6 plus h times 6 minus, uh, sorry, 6 over. So I multiply this first guy by 6 over 6. I get this. And then the second guy I multiply by 6 plus h over 6 plus h. And everything is still being divided by h. Can you see that okay? Yes, sir. So then. Find the two. So that's going to be 6 minus 6 plus h divided by 6 times 6 plus h. And all of this is being divided. And I'm going to stop writing it like that and start writing it as multiplied by 1 over h because it, it just feels less clunky. So this big parenthesis here is all this stuff after I combine the two fractions, right, the numerator is 6 minus 6 plus h, and this goes in parentheses because the fraction is a grouping symbol. And then if you look at these, when I distribute this negative, and that'll be 6 minus 6 minus h. So it's the limit as h goes to 0 of 6 minus 6 minus h over six times six plus h, all being multiplied by one over h. Well, the sixes go away, of course, right? Six minus six, that's zero. This is the limit as h goes to zero of negative h over six times six plus h times one over h. And now we've gotten to the good space here where I can cancel this H with this H. And 
And when I do that, this guy goes away. He becomes 1 over 1. This becomes negative 1 over 6 times 6 plus h. And now that we've canceled the factor of h from the bottom, I don't have any issues sending h to 0. I can just go ahead and plug in 0 for h now. And that'll give me negative 1 over 6 times 6, right? 6 times 6 plus 0. So that's negative 1, 36. Comfy with all of those steps? Feels good. Okay, cool. So remember that the negative first power just means the reciprocal of, 1 over, and that we have to do it in groups. We can't do them separately because powers don't distribute over addition. So the 6 plus h to the negative 1 is not the same as 1 sixth plus 1 over h. It's 1 over 6 plus h. And then the 6 to the negative 1 is, of course, 1 sixth. Then we have a common denominator. That's these two steps on the second line. After we have our common denominator, we just combine like terms upstairs. And that'll allow us to cancel the h's. And then with the h canceled, I can go ahead and send the remaining h to 0 without any sort of uh, problems with the uh, 0 downstairs. I have another question. Sure. So what if the same question was raised to the negative 2? Um, then you would have 1 over 6 plus h all squared okay. minus 1 over 36. And then everything else would go more or less the same. Um, now I think this thing should be, should be ready to go now. At least it is claiming to be. So let me try to get back to the doc cam because I know that is a lot more readable. <sighs> Please work. Please. Yay. All right. And there are two more from the homework we wanted to see there, right? Uh, remind me which which those were. Sixteen and twenty-one, I think. Okay. So here's this. I see there's something waiting for me in the chat. There, I'll take a look at that. So this, of course, is. Well, try camera. You gotta try. There we go. Ah, come on. Strangest things going on with the software. Okay, so 16 and 21 remain from the homework. I see Tybee also wanted to look at 13. Um, Stephanie, the homework question we just did was was number 13. So that's the one that Tybee asked for. Um, and then we said 16 and 21, right? Yeah, 16 is neat. That's a multiply by the conjugate thing. And then 21. Ah, this is a good one. Okay, yeah. So let's do 16 first. First, I, I guess, let me do the uh, uh, today. More limits. Um, specifically, we're going to look more at 2.3 and 2.5, maybe 2.6. We may have to save 2.6 for Friday. Uh, so the next homework question is homework two, number 16. 
and we wanted to look at the limit as x goes to 20, negative 24, of the square root of x squared plus 49, really? Okay, 49 minus 25 all over x plus 24. So this might just be some gnarly RNG here, the fact that I got these somewhat large numbers, but, um, but it's not too bad. In any case, what we're going to need to do is multiply by the conjugate, right? This should remind you of the problem we looked at last time uh, that required that multiply by the conjugate trick, because I've got a square root of something minus some constant here. And as I send x to negative 24, the bottom is definitely going to zero. So I'm going to need to cancel that factor somehow. Um, and I suspect that the top will also go to zero. Now I'm not sure off the, off the top of my head what the square of 24 is. But we can double check that if we plug in negative 24, we really do get 0 over 0. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, no, my bad. This calculator doesn't take commands very well. So negative 24 plus 49 is 25. Oh, I need the square first. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So 24 squared plus 49. 625, and if I raise that to be one half power, I get 25. Yeah, so the top and bottom both go to zero. If you plug in negative 24 for x, this looks like zero over zero. So you can't plug in. All right, so because the, the thing looks like zero over zero, if we just plug in, um, we know we can't just plug in right away. We're going to have to do some algebra. And the algebra that works for limits that are kind of shaped like this, where you've got the square root of some expression with your variable underneath it, um, minus some constant, is to multiply by the conjugate. Uh, the conjugate of this numerator is the same expression, just with this minus changed to a plus. So that's going to be the move. We're going to multiply by the conjugate. So my limit is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 24 of <clears throat> the square root of x squared plus 49 minus 25 over x plus 24. And then here's the conjugate multiplication trick. So I'm going to take this expression, change this minus to a plus, and then I'll multiply by that top and bottom. So that'll be the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25. And if I'm going to multiply by that upstairs, I need to multiply by that downstairs. In other words, I'm going to multiply this by 1. So I don't change the value of the function. It's just one written in a really clever way as the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25. And this might look messy. And frankly, it is a little messy, but that's OK. You know, we've got a calculator that we can use for our arithmetic as needed. Um, but the big news is that upstairs, when we multiply these out, something nice will happen. get the limb, x to negative 24. I'm not going to write out all of the foil steps here, um, because it will, one, it'll take up a lot of space, and two, last time I did this, I said I'm only going to do that once. So when I multiply these two numerators, right, we think of them as two binomials. They need to be foiled out. Fractions are grouping symbols, so that means you always need to think of the top and bottom as being in parentheses. So here's my first and my first. This times this 
right, this one square root times the square root, because they're the same things under the square root, I'll have the square root of all this shit squared. So that's just going to be x squared plus 49. And then I'll have minus 25 times the square root of x squared plus 49 for my inners and plus 25 times the square root of x squared plus 49 for my outers. This exactly cancels with this. So the inners and the outers cancel. So I'm not even going to write them. That's the whole point of the multiply by the conjugate trick is that the inners and the outers cancel. Then what's going to be left here is minus, right, just my last. So minus 25 times 25. And 25 squared is 625, right? Just verify that, right? Oh, shit. I hate it. This thing doesn't take copy of keyboard commands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is my numerator. I've got x squared plus 49 times x squared plus 49 all under a square root, which is the square root of x squared plus 49 all squared, which is just x squared plus 49. My outers and my inners cancel because this is the whole conjugate thing. And then I'll have minus 25 times 25, which is minus 625. Now the rest of this is downstairs. I have my x plus 24 times the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25. And I know that my goal is to cancel this factor, the x plus 24 factor. So I shouldn't do anything with that. I shouldn't distribute these out. I should not multiply this across this. My goal is to cancel this factor, which means I need to leave it there as a factor. But what I will do is combine like terms in the numerator and see if I can factor that. So this is the lim as x goes to negative 24. 49 minus 625. Why does it keep doing that? It used to take these commands. All right, 49 minus 625. It's negative 576. So this is x squared minus 576 all over x plus 24 times the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25, like this. So then the question is, can I factor the numerator? And more particularly, is x plus 24 a factor of the numerator? It should be, because the numerator went to 0 when I plugged in negative 24 before. So x squared minus 576, we have to hope that 576 is a perfect square. And if we're lucky, it's the square of 24. In other words, we hope that we can factor this as a difference of squares. We can check. If I take 576, uh, this thing. Take 576 and divide by 24, we get 24. So yeah, 576 is 24 squared. I'll rewrite it like that just once to help us see what we're doing. This is the limit as x approaches negative 24 of x squared minus 24 squared over x plus 24 times the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25. Right. So that numerator will factor as a difference of squares. He'll factor as x minus 24 times x plus 24, the same way x squared minus 1 factors as x minus 1 times x plus 1. So this is the limit as x approaches negative 24 of x minus 24 times x plus 24 all over x plus 24 
times the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25. So I think this is a good place to take a second and pause and make sure that you've got everything in your notes that I have on the page here. And if you have any questions, on, now would be a good time to ask about them because this is all the kind of finagly algebra work done. In my next step, I'm going to cancel the x plus 24s, and then we'll go ahead and send x to negative 24 and see what we get. So questions up to here. Everybody's comfy with the multiply by the conjugate trick that we used? Comfy with how the algebra went? Flowing out that numerator to get x squared minus 576? That's the bulk of the work for sure. I'm gonna need some practice, but yeah, it makes sense. Okay, yeah, so go through the FOIL step here slowly. And then just always remember that fractions have their tops and bottoms in parentheses. We don't write them, they're implied by the fraction bar, but never forget that. So now I can go ahead and cancel the x plus 24s. They're gone. And I get lim x approaches negative 24 of x minus 24. That doesn't have any issues over this term is gone now, so I just have the square root of x squared plus 49 plus 25, right? When we cancel a factor, it just becomes one. So that, that thing times one is just that thing. And now as I send x to negative 24, I don't have any problems, right? Uh, this bottom isn't going to be zero because instead of having a minus 25, it's a plus 25. Uh, and this top will be whatever it is, a uh, negative 48. That's negative 48, right? Negative 24 minus 24 is negative 48. And then downstairs here, we might want a little bit of help with the calculator. Um, negative 24 squared plus 49, though, was 625. We already did that calculation. Plus 25. And again, we already did the calculation to find that 625 is 25 squared. So this is negative 48 over the square root of 625 is 25 plus 25 is 50. And then if you want, uh, there is some cancellation that can be done between those. Clean them up a little bit. They're definitely both divisible by two. Um, that's 24 over 25, right? So I think that's as far as we could we could hope to clean that up. So we can take a second and look over this. Uh, again, my strong recommendation is that everything I write on the doc cam, you guys write in your own notes, and then. Um, and then take a look and see if there's any step where you would want more commentary or anything like that if you had to explain it to somebody else. Is there any step here that we would like to discuss a little bit more? We come through with this step, like how we knew to multiply by this and why we multiply top and bottom by it, all that. So anytime I get a zero over zero out of an expression that looks like this, or square root of some variable stuff plus or minus some constant, it's a good hint to try multiplying by the conjugate. So that's what we're doing in this step. Any questions about how we get to here from the previous step? The foiling? Is anybody getting anything different or seeing anything that worries them? And then from here to here, we just took the plus 49 and minus 625 to 575. 
here we wrote uh, five, sorry, 576 as 24 squared, because it is. We checked that with the calculator. Uh, on an exam, I wouldn't give you a problem with such large numbers. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need a calculator to verify that this is a perfect square. But having written that as x squared minus 24 squared, I can factor the top as a difference of squares, right? a squared minus b squared is always a minus b times a plus b. So that's here to here. And then we cancel, cancel. And finally, the problem factor, x plus 24, is gone from the denominator. So I can go ahead and just plug in. Cool. I think we also wanted to look at number 21. If you want more time with that problem, of course, uh, I'll have the video from today's lecture up in just a little bit. Um, you can you can check that out, or you can come by the office hour. I am going to have an office hour today. Twenty one is a fun problem. So we say the limit as x goes to zero of f of x over x squared equals three. Is homework two. Number twenty one. So this is what we have. And the idea here is that we should be able to use our limit laws somehow. But we don't have any sort of concrete stuff to work with. It's really very abstract. So all I know is that when you divide f of x by x squared and then send x to 0, you get 3 out. But I have no idea what the function f of x is, and there's nowhere near enough information for me to recover the function f of x. So what I need to do is, in each of these expressions, I need to make f of x over x squared show up somehow. I can multiply and divide by x squared. And that won't change the value of the function. All right, again, I'm just multiplying by 1. And then regroup the symbols. Do we agree that, that this? is the same as this. Right, you can cancel the x squareds if you wanted to. And the thing on the right here is, is just f of x. But this is nice because the only thing I know for this whole problem is that f of x over x squared on its own goes to 3. So I know that this piece right here is going to go to 3. What is this piece going to do? You're going to go to zero. Yeah, exactly. He's going to go to zero. So if I write this out carefully, it's going to look like this. We're using our limit laws here. So I'm going to say that this is one function, and this is another function. So this is the limit as x goes to zero of f of x over x squared times the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. Right? I think of this as one function and this as another function. And then I have a limit law that says the limit as x goes to a of one function times another function is equal to the limit of the first function times the limit of the second function. And now this is. 3 times 0, which is 0. 
Okay, so think of it like this. We've got these, these two functions here, f of x over x squared and x squared. I wanna take the limit as x goes to zero of the product of those two functions. And to do that, I can take the limit of each one separately. This guy goes to three because that's the only thing I know about, about the problem. And this guy goes to zero because he's x squared and I'm sending x to zero. And the magic here was somehow making f of x over x squared show up. That was the work. The way I was able to do that is just by multiplying and dividing by x squared because I started off with just f of x. I wanted to make this show up. So the trick there is to get an x squared downstairs. Okay, if I'm gonna introduce an x squared downstairs, I need to introduce one upstairs as well. Otherwise, I'll change the value of the function. And then I regroup. I take the f of x with the x squared downstairs. Think of that on its own because that's something I know about. And then I take the x squared and leave him on the outside so I can mess with him on his own. This is a sneaky problem. I like this problem. Um, because it requires a little bit of, of clever creative thought, and it's not super obvious. Do we see what's going on here, how we were able to do this? So what would I need to multiply and divide by in the second part? Remember, all I know is that f of x over x squared goes to three. So somehow I need to make f of x over x squared show up here. How can I do that? So I think we can multiply f of x over x times one over x. I. It's true that if I multiply this by one over x, it will become this. But if I do that, if I just multiply by one over x, then I'll be changing this whole thing. So if I'm gonna divide by x, I also need to multiply by x. So it's not one over x that I'll multiply by, it's x over x. You're correct that in order to get the x squared downstairs, I need a one over x. But remember, I also don't want to, so here, let me write it like this. I also don't want to change the limit. So if I'm going to multiply by something, I need to divide by it. Or if I'm going to divide by something, I need to multiply by it. All right, so let's think of it like this, yeah? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. It's still equal to this. This is still the same as this. I haven't changed the value, and that's important if I'm going to claim that these things are equal. But now if I group the terms, no stress, we'll have f of x over x squared, which is what I needed to make show up in order to, to be able to use this, times x. And now, just like we did in the previous guy, I can treat those limits separately. That's the limit as x goes to zero of f of x over x squared times the limit as x goes to zero of x. And this guy is three, this guy is zero. So this is also zero. So this is definitely another one of those where you're going to have to think quite hard. If you want to make this look more like the way it looks in our limit laws, we were using those square brackets, right? But it's very sneaky. The step going from here to here is very sneaky, just like the step going from here to here is very sneaky. Uh, definitely requires a little bit of creativity. It's kind of like having a common denominator, right? It's kind of similar. Um, 
I have f of x and I want to write it as something with the fraction uh, x squared downstairs. So in order to do that, I had to multiply by x squared downstairs and upstairs. Had to multiply by x squared upstairs because I want this to be equal to this. If I just divided by x squared, then these wouldn't be the same function anymore. So if I'm going to divide by x squared, I must also multiply by x squared. And then I split that up into two pieces, the f of x over x squared and the x squared over 1. I can take the limit of this because it's the thing that I had information about. That's all the information I had. And then I can take the limit of this because I know how to take the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. I can picture the graph of x squared. And as x goes to 0 from both sides, we're definitely approaching 0. And it's the same sort of thing in part b. So again, my advice would be to make sure that everything I have written here, you have written in your notes. That way you can think about it a little bit more after class if you want to. Um, and also you could you'd consider rewatching this part of the video. Um, I am tempted to say just one more little thing about this and it's, it's not super obvious. So before I do that, I would like to answer any questions you guys have about the actual problem solving here. Any, any questions about the actual steps we took to solve the problem here? No, sir. I don't think so. Okay. So, I want to ask, what does it mean? That lim x to zero, f of x over x squared is three. Uh, which I understand is a very open-ended question, right? I mean, it means that f of x over x squared, if you think of that as its own function, gets closer and closer to three as x gets closer and closer to zero, that's good. But algebraically, is there anything I can say? And there is. Uh, remember, when we solve these problems, like the problem we just did, where there is a factor downstairs that goes to zero, the whole game was to somehow manipulate algebraically the top in order to get something to cancel with that. Um, I hope you don't mind. I am going to set it to mute all. So if you need to speak or ask a question, just hold down the space bar in order to do so. We can think of this as meaning there is a factor of x squared hiding in the top, hiding inside f of x. And what's left goes to 3. That is, f of x is equal to x squared times g of x for some function g of x having lim x to 0 g of x equals 3. This is really what's going on here. And it's, it's an intuitive thing. This has nothing to do with how you would solve the problem, right? Solving the problem is exactly what we did before. Um, and I would not suggest thinking of it this way in order to solve the problem, but it might give you some insight as to why we can solve the problem that way. So with this in mind, right, like think about the last problem that we did. We were able to manipulate algebraically until we could pull a factor of x plus 24 out of the numerator, which meant that that factor was really hiding there the whole time. It was just disguised algebraically. Well, here there's no algebra disguising the factor of x squared in the numerator. Um, it's just 
kind of buried inside of f of x. But what this means is that the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x over x squared is really the limit as x goes to 0. We said f of x has an x squared factor hiding inside of it. And then there's whatever's left over. Who knows what that is? But the limit of that thing is 3. So this is the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times g of x. And then the denominator is still x squared. And then, of course, these x squareds will cancel. And you just get the limit as x goes to 0 of g of x, which we said is 3. So this is really what's going on there. Anytime you have the denominator going to 0, but the overall limit coming out to some finite number, that means that there's a factor in the numerator which could be canceled with that denominator. So again, I would, I would encourage you to, to write this down, make sure this is in your notes, and have it in your notes after the example problem we just worked, and that way you can kind of compare uh, the ideas. I don't want to burn too much time on this. I, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily expect this to immediately sit well with you, um, but I do think it's worth reflecting on as you do the homework. So the last one that we wanted to look at was, oh, that was the last one we wanted to look at, right? OK. So then last time, um, we talked about these limit laws. We worked a bunch of the problems where we do some algebra manipulation, um, which means it's time for us to talk about continuity. So you guys should be fairly adept at calculating limits now. Let me see if there's anything else in the homework that, that we really should go over together. I think I think we're pretty well practiced at this. Oh no, that's Calc two. Uh, pretty well practiced with this stuff at this point. But in case there are any other doozies in here, I'd like to work a similar example. I don't think there really are though. Yeah, stuff from graphs, limit laws. This is good stuff. Whether the conjugate, I mean, it's really the same. So number fifteen. Just a word to the wise. This is also going to look like a, a multiply by the conjugate thing. Um, and you're going to want to factor the bottom at some point. 17 is a squeeze theorem thing. That's where we left off. So let's do, let's do one of these squeeze theorem problems before we wrap up on 2.3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So uh, recall. Squeeze theorem says if f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x and limit as x approaches a of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a of h of x, call it L, then the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals L also. All right, this is where we left off last time. We also call this the policeman theorem, all right? If there's a policeman, so you are g of x. If there's a policeman behind you and a policeman in front of you, and both of those policemen are going to the same place, then you are also going to that place, all right? If you're trapped between two guys and both of those guys are going to L, then you're also going to L. That's what the squeeze theorem says. This is a surprisingly powerful tool. Um, there's a picture that goes along with this that I didn't really illustrate ideally for you last time. So let me make a more attempt at drawing that picture for you. Uh, the idea is usually like I've got something that's oscillating really wildly so that it's hard for me to, to get at what this limit might be. But then I can bound it above. So this is my g of x. Uh, this is where I'm trying to take the limit here, a. 
and I've got some function that bounds g from above that we call h of x. And I've got some function that bounds g from below that we call f of x. And so this number right here that we're both approaching, that all three are approaching in the middle, that's L. So it's hard to see what the limit as x goes to A of G of x is. That's the game, right? If it's hard to see what the limit of the middle guy is because he's behaving so weirdly, you can try to find two functions, one that bounds him from above and one that bounds him from below, that both do the same thing at A. And then you can be certain that the limit of G of X as X approaches A is the same as the two bounding functions. And the classic example for this uh, is something like the limit as X goes to zero of X squared times the sine of one over x. Okay. Now my art skills are limited as is clearly evidenced by this drawing. So I'm gonna pop open a Desmos tab. So first let's look at sine of one over x on its own. Everybody see what this thing is doing? Why this is a challenge? As x goes to zero, one over x gets really, really big. So the sine of one over x starts oscillating like a madman. It's impossible for me to smaller. No. All right, whatever. Right? And if you zoom in here, you'll see that you just like these lines get more and more and more and more dense. So can anybody tell me what the hell this thing is doing near zero? Like, it looks like it's just taking up this whole space, right? It doesn't look like this function is approaching any one particular value as x gets closer and closer to zero. There's all these values. It's all over the place. It's just bouncing back and forth really, really, really fast. So the sine of one over x term this piece acts really weird. As x goes to zero. Because as x goes to zero, one over x is going to infinity. And so the sine of one over x is going to start wobbling back and forth faster and faster and faster and faster. but I can evaluate this limit using the squeeze theorem. Now, if I look at the graph of x squared times sine of one over x, you'll be able to guess what that limit is. Looks like he's getting smushed down here to zero. And then the, the picture for the squeeze theorem, here's your upper bound function, here's your lower bound function, notice that the red is trapped between the blue and the green. And that the blue and the green do the same thing as x approaches zero. So since the red is trapped in between them, no matter how tight I zoom in, red always trapped between blue and green, blue and green going to the same place as x approaches zero, that means the red is also gonna be forced to go to that place. So I'll show you what this this process looks like. One of our last examples from section 2.3, let's evaluate the limit as x goes to zero of x squared times the sine of one over x. We're going to use the squeeze theorem. A 
observe that negative one is less than or equal to the sine of one over x is less than or equal to one. All right, the sine function, no matter what you put inside of it, is always bounded between negative one and one. All right, no matter what you do, uh, no matter what you're asking the sine of, Remember, the sine function gives the y value on the unit circle, and that unit circle only has y values running between negative 1 and 1. So no matter what the inside is, sine of any shit is always trapped between negative 1 and 1. If I then multiply through this inequality everywhere by x squared, that means negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared times the sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared itself. And this is starting to look very much like this type of inequality that's in the squeeze theorem. Now the way the squeeze theorem is written says, here's my F, here's my G, and here's my H. If the limit of f and h, the limit of the two outside guys, are equal to each other, in this case I'm trying to take the limit as x goes to zero, then the limit of the inside guy has to be equal to that as well. The nicest way I'm aware of to implement this, the kind of easiest way to do this, is to remember that limits respect inequalities. That was the theorem we discussed before discussing the squeeze theorem. So from here, I'm just going to take limits everywhere. So now sending x to 0, we get lim x to 0 of negative x squared is less than or equal to lim x to 0 x squared sine 1 over x is less than or equal to lim x to 0 of x squared. So once you have your squeeze-like inequality, which you usually build by starting with some obvious bound and then multiplying or dividing through by whatever is necessary in order to make your function show up in the middle. Take limits everywhere. If the limits on the outside are equal, you'll see what you get. What is the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared? What is the limit on the left here? Don't think too hard about this. Zero. Yeah, zero, right? You can just plug in. This guy is continuous at zero. There's no problems there. So this is zero is less than or equal to, well, the thing in the middle is what I'm trying to figure out. What is the limit as x goes to zero of x squared? Yeah, this is also zero, right? X squared is continuous at zero. You can just plug in. So this is what we get. So this middle guy has no choice. He's trapped between zero and zero. He's got to be zero. The way we finish this up is so by the squeeze theorem, lim x to 0, x squared times the sine of 1 over x is 0. And this is a really typical squeeze theorem problem. They all kind of go like this. You start with some obvious bound, and then you use that bound to build up an inequality with your function in the middle. Then you take limits everywhere and hope that the two outside limits are the same. If they're not the same, you've got to go back and build some other inequality. If those two limits are the same, then observe that your limit, the thing you want, is trapped between two equal constants. The only things that are both bigger than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero is zero itself. Right? That's the only way to be both greater than or equal to zero and less than two or equal to zero. So if you are yourself zero which means that this limit is zero. And that's the squeeze theorem. That's how it works. It's going to take some time, though. And the hard part for most people, 
building the inequality. So I, I would like to get a little bit more practice with this before we dive into um, 2.5. Let me, let me grab one more example. So this one is very similar to the one from your homework, or the first one from your homework. You have to do the calculation by hand. The problem before that, that gives you the inequality to start with. Um, but I would like at least one more example. Shit, come on. Yeah, that is that example, isn't it? Hmm. That'll be at least one more, right? No. Ah. So most of the examples that involve the squeeze theorem are going to come up in section 2.6 when we have limits at infinity. Um, but, yeah, here's one more. Oh, yeah, this is good. Let's do this one. This one looks a little different. So one more squeeze theorem problem. And then we'll move to section 2.5. We want to evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 from the right. of the square root of x times e raised to the sine of pi over x. Which is looking a little bit complicated, right? No, I guess, that, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, in the limit no, in the notation, is that a plus sign above the zero? It is, yeah. This is the limit as x goes to zero from the right. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason for the plus is because the square root of x here is only defined if x is positive. All right? if, um, if we didn't have that to deal with, then we could look at the two-sided limit also. The challenge here is that this sine of pi over x, just like the sine of 1 over x, he oscillates madly as x gets close to zero. So really quick, let's try and wrap our heads around why this is hard. So now, here is e raised to the sine of pi over x. You see, he does the same sort of crazy shit that sine 1 over x does. Similar, not identical. The e raised to that power, rather than just having sine of pi over x on its own, is going to do a few things. First off, it's going to make everything positive, because exponential functions never output any negatives. And then secondly, it's going to, going to make this behavior as we go out a little bit different. It's going to make the shape of the graph a little bit different. But the, the core problem is still here, and that's the really rapid oscillation as x gets close to zero. Notice that this piece on its own is bounded above by y equals e and bounded below by what do you think? What do we think? So notice how this purple line is a good upper bound for this graph. The graph never goes above this purple line. What do we think would be a good lower bound? What's the smallest that e raised to the pi over x could ever get? What's the smallest that the sine of pi over x itself could ever get? I want to say negative. Negative what? Like sin pi over x, but I don't know. So sine of pi over x. Yes. Is that. Function. So that piece itself is always bounded between negative 1 and positive 1. So e raised to the sine of pi over x is bounded above by e to the 1 and bounded below by e to the negative 1. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. OK. So the sine of 1 over x or sine of pi over x has this oscillation problem near 0. And the way we're going to get at this is using the squeeze theorem, which requires first having a good bound. 
And that's where we need to start is with this inequality. So the inequality building is rough. Um, let me walk you through how, how I'd recommend you do this. So again, we're gonna use the squeeze theorem. Sine of pi over x itself is always bounded below by negative one and above by positive one. And now I'm gonna start with this obvious bound, sine function, never smaller than negative one, never bigger than positive one, and slowly build this whole thing. My first step is going to be to exponentiate everywhere in this inequality. This means that e to the negative one is less than or equal to e to the sine of pi over x is less than or equal to e to the positive one. And that's the inequality that I was demonstrating here. All right, e to the negative one is always smaller than the red. e to the positive one is always bigger than the red. Now the only thing I need to do in order to build my inequality with this function in the middle is to multiply through by the square root of x. So one more step of inequality building. Oh, shit. Squared x times e to the one. And um, I know that students in Calc 1 especially tend to hate building inequalities like this. Um, and I hate to say it, but you're going to have to get over that. You're going to have to practice this shit. You're going to have to get good at it. The heart of calculus is all inequalities. Um, this is going to be important, not just right now, but also in section 2.6, not just in section 2.6, but a few other sections in Calc 1, and then in many places in the middle third of Calc 2. Um, so this sort of thing is something we're going to need to practice. But now I've got an inequality where my function is in the middle and the two functions on the outside are things I can take the limit of. They're not too hard to work with. So let's go ahead and take limits everywhere. So I'm gonna send x to zero from the right everywhere in this inequality. That will give me lim x to zero plus root x times e to the negative one is less than or equal to lim x to zero plus root x times e to the sine of pi over x is less than or equal to lim x to zero plus root x times e. What is the limit on the left? What does the square root of x do as x goes to zero from the right? All right, here's the graph of root x. So if I'm walking along this graph, my x value is getting closer and closer to zero from the right. What are my y values approaching? In other words, forget about the e to the negative one over here. All right? I don't care about him. I think the limit gonna go to zero. Yeah, exactly, right? As x goes to zero from the right, the square root of x goes to zero. So this constant doesn't have any effect on that limit. Yeah. So this is zero times e to the negative one is less than or equal to the limit I want. And what about this limit? He's got the same sort of thing going on, right? This is just a constant. And this x goes to zero from the right, the square root of x goes to zero. Also the time. But zero times e to the negative one and zero times e are both zero. e to the negative one is like one third, and e is like three. That's the, the engineer's approximation for E and, and the reciprocal of E. Um, so this is like zero times one third, this is like zero times three, both of those are zero. So zero is less than or equal to the limit I want. Zero 
is less than or equal to zero. And the only way to be both bigger than and smaller than zero at the same time is to be zero. Therefore, the limit as x approaches zero from the right, square root x e to the sine of pi over x equals zero by the squeeze theorem. So these squeeze theorem problems will take some practice. Building the inequality and kind of getting comfortable with the steps. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to feel easy at first. But if you practice it enough, you will be able to get, get your head around it and you'll get comfy with the mechanics. Um, questions on these, these last two problems, how we solved them, what we did, why we did it. Okay, so then before I let you go, we're getting close to the end of class. Before I let you go, I do want to introduce the concepts in section 2.5. So I'll do a quick intro to 2.5, and then on Friday we'll discuss 2.5 and 2.6 in earnest. Two point five is on continuity. We have in our mind an idea of what a continuous function is. It's one whose graph we can draw without lifting our pencil. But how do we make that precise? How do we make that rigorous? Let me just give you the definition. The function f of x is continuous at the number a means that f of a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x. That's the definition. So if as you inch closer and closer and closer to A along the graph of F of X, you are getting closer and closer to the actual value of the function there, then the function is said to be continuous at A. So it's something that happens one point at a time. This is something which is true or false. one point at a time. In other words, a function may be continuous at zero, but not continuous at a equals one or a equals two, or a equals five, All right? So it's something you have to check one point at a time. Uh, sure, yeah, if you, if you have to leave, uh, just make sure you type something in chat so I've got you there. Uh, if you wanna make a group chat for the class, I would appreciate being added to that just so I could follow the conversation. I know that sometimes group chats and online classes can get a little, sideways from the lecture content. I'm not sure. I don't know if I really want to be in a group chat for the, the students either, but I would appreciate some reassurance that we're not like just sharing homework answers or something like that. Uh, obviously, I can't stop you from doing it. So if, if you want to do that, go, go ahead. Um, but please um, be mindful of the academic integrity rules. So before I let you go again, this is the definition. I'd like to illustrate how it can succeed and how it can fail.
Okay. So let me call this two, three, B eight X equals four. Over here is five. Now this one, two, three, five. Okay. So here's a graph of a function. He's got all sorts of stuff going on. I want to ask whether this function is continuous or not at this point, at this point, at this point, and at this point. So is, yeah, let's do it like this. Let's go see the graph. Is this function continuous at two? Well, to check that, I need to check whether this definition is satisfied with a equals two plugged in. So we check, is f of two equal to the limit as x approaches two of f of x? Well, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x? Three. Right, yeah. This hole is right here at, at y value 3. Yeah, let us say this. OK, and what is f of 2? Undefined? If, yeah, f of 2, this doesn't exist. In other words, 2 is not in the domain. of f of x. So if something doesn't exist, could that same thing be equal to 3? No. No. So therefore, f of 2 is not equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, because f of 2 does not exist. Hence, f of x is not continuous at a equals 2. All right. So there's a take home lesson here. And that's that in order for a function to even have a chance of being continuous at a point, it has to be defined there. In order for this definition to be satisfied, f of a has to exist. a has to be in the domain of f. There's no way to be continuous at a value that is not in your domain. Since 2 is not in the domain for this function, being continuous at 2 isn't even a question. Well, I mean, it is a question. The answer is no. It's obviously no. OK, since we are a little short on time, I'd like to run through this idea for these other points, but I'm not going to write everything down. Is f of x continuous at a equals 3? What is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x? Mm. Right. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x is equal to 2. What is f of 3? Five. 
next slide. Yeah, good. So is this continuous at A equals three? Well, F of three is five and limb X approaches three of F of X is two. And five is definitely not equal to two, so no. Is f of x continuous at four? No, we've got a vertical asymptote there, right? So again, f of x isn't even defined at four. f of x is undefined at four. Uh, so we couldn't possibly hope to be continuous there. What about at five? It is continuous. Yeah, yeah, no problems there. F of five is Yay. one. And the limit as x approaches five of f of five is one. Yeah. Two. At a equals five. Uh, so this is kind of the picture. And there's one other way a function can fail to be continuous, and that's if it the one-sided limits are not the same. Uh, in other words, if this limit fails to exist. But this is the basic idea. A discontinuity like this one, a hole, where there isn't some other value there, that's called a removable discontinuity. I could fix the discontinuity by defining f of 2 to be 3. I could fill in the hole. Here, this is a similar problem. It's another discontinuity. Um, and I don't think your book classifies these as removable because the function is already defined at 3. But you could fix the discontinuity there by redefining f of 3 to be 2. The discontinuity we see here at 4 it's called an infinite function blows up to be infinite, right? Or goes down to negative infinity. Either way, there's no repairing that, right? There's nothing you can do to fix that. Now, the other type of discontinuity we're going to see is what's called a jump discontinuity. So we'll pick this conversation up here next time. But a jump discontinuity looks like, right? So the function from the left and then another thing from the right. So that the limit as x approaches that value, so it's six here. So this is our definition of continuity. And you want to think about that. What does it mean for this to exist, for this to exist, and for them to be continuous? Because each one of those can fail. A function can fail to be continuous by this not existing. A function can fail to be continuous by this limit not existing. And even if both of those things exist, a function can still fail to be continuous by them not being, which is what we saw like here when x is, uh, when a is equal to 3. So next time on Friday, we're going to continue this discussion of continuity from section 2.5. Uh, we'll play around with a lot of specific examples. Usually they're going to come from piecewise defined uh, And then we will talk a little bit about limits at infinity, which is a, a fun section. It's not You'll find those very easily and very quickly. Um, but 2.5 is something that requires generally a, a lot of thought. Uh, so take a look at the homework problems. If you haven't yet, make sure you finish up homework one. Hopefully everybody is, is pretty much done with that. And dig into homework two. Uh, by Friday, everybody should be at least halfway through homework two, if not a little bit more. Uh, and then we will talk more about continuity and limits at infinity. Then. Uh, I do have an office hour today from 1 to 2 p.m. So if you're hung up on anything or having a hard time with anything, um, just click the office hour link in the uh, I'm sorry I didn't have my normal office hour on Monday. I had to. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to add an, another office hour. I think it will probably be Thursday. And probably around um, But I haven't put that in stone yet. I'm still looking into it. So before you leave, please type your words here in the chat so I have a good record of attendance. And then uh, you are welcome to exit the meeting. Any uh, last questions? Well, 
All right. Yeah. Once you hold on, uh, signal that you are here. That you sign up, and uh, I will either see you later in the office hour or on Friday. Ah, check your email. Yeah, Hotanji, uh, check your email. I did send it to you. Uh, I sent you a Google Drive link. No problem. All right, is everybody signed in? And I will go ahead and end the meeting. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of the day. If you need anything, I'm going to come by the office hour or something like that.